Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, well, it's a pretty neutral Florida Wednesday, I have to say. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's going to be hot later on. It's, in fact, going to be miserably hot later on. The humidity is back. We did have a very nice little patch of non-humid cool weather that was kind of unusual for late May, but that's now gone, it's departed, and the uh, summer weather is on the way. In fact, we had our first big summer rain yesterday uh, in the afternoon, you know, where all the humidity sort of builds up and builds up and then unleashes in a tropical downpour. So uh, it's, uh, it's just that time of year again, and uh, the suffering is here to stay, uh, at least for the next four or five months until we're given a reprieve in the season. Uh, you know, I haven't done a video in a little while, so I had to give you a quick weather report. Sorry, it's just what I do. Um, again, it's just, you know, for one thing, I'm kind of slowing down for summer. Uh, my indoor storage is at a bit of a minimum, so, you know, the older cars that I kind of deal with, they really shouldn't be outside under any circumstances. Uh, you don't want to have a 73 duster in the elements at this point. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm kind of cutting it down a little bit, uh, trying to come up with some other cars around me. Uh, in fact, I've got, um, not as part of my flock, a, uh, I believe it's a 72 Monte Carlo on the way, and I'm trying to convince my friend Patrick, uh, who uh, is pretty good at smoking meats, don't you? Anyway, he's pretty good at smoking meats, it turns out. Uh, he has a Pontiac G8 with some uh, tuning done that I'd like to do as well, so hopefully we get those going. Uh, but uh, the goats, none of them around. Again, haven't seen them in a long, long time. The Porsche day where they were walking on the Boxster was the last time I saw them. Uh, from what I hear, they're still with us, but honestly, I'm skeptical. I just think Peter doesn't want to be known as a murderer of goats, and uh, who can blame him in this climate? You could easily be canceled for such a thing. So, uh, you know, we haven't seen them. And frankly, the birds, there's birds at work that are attacking people. And I can't tell you how happy that makes me. I really can't. Uh, one attacked little Richard the other day, violently, violently. He ran screaming from it like a woman. And, uh, you know, all I can say is that I've been predicting this. I've been talking about it. And people, oh, what's with the birds? Oh, the birds, you know, they're God's creatures. Yeah, they're God's creatures until they're pecking your eyes out. And uh, that very nearly happened to little Richard recently, and uh, even if that gives me a certain amount of pleasure uh, to be correct, I definitely wouldn't want to see poor little Richard wearing an eye patch. Maybe. Uh, anyway, I won't carry on about all that. I know it takes me a long time to get into these videos, so we're going to leap right into this one. And what I have today is the last Buick Riviera. I mean, not really the last one, but uh, the last year, in fact, 99, and this is so tragic to me. I mean, it's absolutely tragic. Number one, I'm going to start this off right, right away. Number one, cars with real names are better. Uh, they just are, and I hate that at a certain point cars went to the sort of European spec naming system where uh, names like El Dorado and Riviera and Toronado all got replaced by a series of letters and digits and numbers, kind of Mercedes and BMW style. I just find that irritating. Uh, you know, I guess, I suppose one could argue that Lincoln's had been, you know, the Mark III, the Mark V, all that sort of thing. They'd been doing it kind of for a while, but General Motors no, and uh, the Riviera, named for, of course, you know, the region of Italy and France on the coast, uh, is truly one of the most beautiful names in automotive history, and frankly, one of the most storied cars in automotive history. And for me to be reviewing this last one, the last Riviera, a car that I actually owned, I had an 85 model. It just is devastating to me. It really is. I mean, I worked at a Buick store uh, starting in, I want to say, 1990. So we dealt with a fair share of Rivieras. I mean, what's Buick doing now? Making a bunch of rebadged Opals made in China and selling them to the Chinese market primarily. In fact, uh, if China didn't like Buick so much, uh, we'd probably still have a Pontiac and uh, Buick would have been absorbed into Cadillac. But, you know, Sun Yat-sen drove a Buick. So, uh, you know, that means we've got what we've got today. But 
here it is. Uh, the first Riviera was actually in 1949. It was an option package on the Roadmaster uh, with port holes, and uh, it's sort of distinguished as being the first hardtop convertible, the uh, first open air with no C pillars. So when you put all four windows down, the whole side was open. That that car, I think the Aldo had it too at the same time, but the, for whatever reason, the Buick is credited with it. Uh, but uh, that really doesn't count Riviera-wise. The first true Riviera uh, was genuinely a masterpiece of a guy named Bill Mitchell, uh, one of GM's design gurus, uh, incredible guy. Uh, he penned, uh, or at least oversaw, the 1963 Riviera, uh, which most uh, car guys kind of think of as the first Riv. And that car was stunning, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it was made to fall into the personal luxury segment, which followed the first, uh, I want to say 58 was the first four-seat personal luxury coupe Thunderbird, which vastly outsold the uh, 55 through 57 models, even if they're more iconic. And uh, Buick wanted a piece of the action, so they came out with the Riviera, not only with that great name, uh, but uh, Mitchell was sort of inspired by seeing a Rolls-Royce in the fog, uh, so the story goes, and he sort of, uh, in his head, molded in a Ferrari to that and came out with this long front end, short deck, elegant lined car, uh, which was just an instant classic. Everybody really, really liked the first Riviera. And uh, that went through, um, what did it go through? 1966, I believe. And uh, then it became, I'm sorry, 65. Uh, the 66 Riviera started to become more bloated. We had one recently, and it was a beautiful car. It was finished in a uh, uh, very rich green color, and it was stunning. Uh, but it did not have the same panache that the first gen had with its four bucket seats and uh, its uh, personal luxury styling. Uh, basically, by 66, the Riviera was well on its way to becoming a Luxo barge. Uh, even in 70, they came out with uh, fender skirts and uh, then there was the, um, uh, what was it, the 71 through 73 Rivs were very controversial. They were called the Bowtail Rivieras. Uh, and, you know, the styling was done by a guy named, um, what the hell was his name, Jerry Hirschberg, which interestingly also made the Infinity J30 in the early 90s, which is also sort of reviled as an ugly car. So uh, this guy was making his mark on <laughs> different manufacturers for a couple of decades. Uh, whether you love it or hate it, the Bowtail Rivieras, uh, and frankly, I like it. I like it a lot. I remember that old movie, uh, what was it, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, uh, with uh, Clint Eastwood and, um, uh, what's his, I always forget his name. <sighs> they blend in, whatever, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, it's going to drive me friggin' nuts. It doesn't matter. Anyway, they drove a uh, Buick uh, Riviera boat tail in it, and I just thought that was kind of a neat car back then. But the sales sucked. The market definitely didn't like it. The gas crisis was there, so it had anemic uh, V8s, like a 455 putting out about, you know, at best 225 horsepower. And uh, it just didn't work at all. Uh, and then that was replaced by this sort of shrunken Sabre sedan-looking thing, which took it through 79. Uh, again, didn't sell particularly well and wasn't particularly special. Even if I do like them, uh, I have to admit the market did not. Uh, and then Buick, the Riviera got reborn a little bit with the uh, 79 through 85, uh, which was by all accounts a very good looking design and had become the first, uh, well, somebody's going to beat me up on that. I think it was the first front driver. I'm almost quite sure of it. Even though the earlier Riv shared a platform with the Tornado, uh, and the Tornado was front drive. I'm pretty sure the Riv held on to the rear drive until 79 uh, when it did become front drive. Uh, that did rebirth the car in terms of sales numbers, and I think they set their all-time Riviera sales record uh, in 1985, uh, of which I had one. I had a beautiful 85. I, I mean, I wish I could go back in time and get that. I bought it when I was at the Buick store. 49,000 mile 85 in silver with gray leather and Astro roof, digital dash, wire wheel covers, and I just loved it. Uh, probably I would have preferred to have one of those uh, T-type rivs that was out a few years earlier, but you know, you get what you get. And uh, still my heart yearns for that car. I beat the crap out of it as kind of a young guy, and uh, it just, you know, it, it went from 
being an absolute garage queen show car to uh, something that uh, looked abandoned and dented in a Lollapalooza concert parking lot. Very, very sad. And then in 86, out came a front drive downsized Riviera, along with all the other downsized GM crap, and people did not like it. It had a weird TV screen dashboard, uh, a weird flat tail on the back, and uh, it was just too small. And the Riviera historical buyer uh, just found it completely unappealing, and sales went down. Uh, they redesigned it in 89. They stretched it out a little bit, uh, which uh, certainly helped and increased sales for a couple of years. Years. Uh, but by that time, the damage was done, and 93 saw the last of that. Buick skipped a year uh, to get this one ready, and then it was released in 95, and it, this, would become the last Buick Riviera. And what a shame, what an end of an era. It was, um, it shared a platform with the Aurora. I did an old school Aurora video lately, or eh, I don't know, a few months ago. Uh, it was kind of a Cadillac derived platform, a G frame, I believe it was, and was extremely advanced for its time. And also, I have to give GM a little bit of credit on this one. Uh, it did show their ability to create very different cars on the same platform, much unlike the badge engineering that so screwed them up in the 80s. Uh, I mean, even though it shares a platform, platform with the Aurora. You put this thing next to an Aurora, they don't look anything alike. They're just completely different cars. And uh, you have to give uh, GM credit for that. Uh, but because it was a full-size platform, it meant this thing was big. Uh, it's not a small car in any way. Uh, 207 inches long. At the time, in 95, actually 7 inches longer than the Eldorado with a longer wheelbase and roughly the same size as the Lincoln Mark 8 that it competed with. Uh, it it was, um, you know, this personal luxury coupe thing was still kind of going then. It was in decline, but with older buyers, it was still going. And you had the Lexus SC, the 300 and 400. Uh, on the higher end, you had the BMW 8 Series. You had the Mark 8. Uh, you had the um, uh, the Riviera and, um, of course, the Eldorado. So uh, there were a few different ones to choose from. Uh, but when this thing came out, you know, here's where it gets... You know, I look at this car now, and I don't see it as beautiful. I'm sorry, I just don't. I mean, I, I see that it doesn't look like any other car that was out at the time. I will certainly argue about that, or, you know, agree with your argument about that. It was different. Uh, it does have very dramatic, very aggressive, very bold looks. I mean, you've got this beluga whale catfish front end with swoop back headlights, eyes, you've got this oval grille uh, at the front, you've got this incredibly uh, complex body line with these wildly curved fenders with a sharp crease on top that diminishes as it goes to the back and then swoops down, uh, very much like the style of that Infiniti J30 and uh, something that wasn't, you know, hugely done at the time. Uh, you've got these big swooping D pillars at the back, you've got diminished C pillars. Uh, I tell you what, I you know, here Here's the thing I would say about this car. If they had made it a hardtop coupe, if they had made those back windows go down, which they don't, and they had made this rear drive with a V8 instead of what is inarguably a fantastic V6, which we'll get into, uh, I think we would have had a classic on our hands. Um, in 99, the last 300 of these were uh, silver arrows, which you know, more correctly, you sort of associate with Mercedes, but Bill Mitchell uh, had made some silver era ribs back in the 60s, and uh, Buick harkened to that. But um, anyway, in 99, they only made 1,956 of these cars, uh, a direct indictment of how badly they were selling, frankly. But uh, I mean, when you think about that number, it's absolutely insane. That's probably Toyota's first hour production run on Camrys. I mean, it's more like a Ferrari production figure uh, than it is a Buick number. 1956 and 99. This is a rare car. Uh, but anyway, it is what it is. Uh, the only straight line on it really is that rub strip down the side, which uh, yeah, thankfully it's there. It might make the thing look a bit slab-sided without it. Those huge and enormous rear quarters going into this oval and full-length taillight assembly, which kind of matches the oval grill in the front and uh, the big twice pipes at the bottom. Uh, for the old guys, they did give you one of these um, uh, trunk latch things that, uh, you know, harkens to an earlier time. Uh, alloy wheel specific to the Riv. You've got the Riviera badge there at the bottom of the, uh, well, more in the middle of the quarter. 
And the styling, you know, I read a bunch of articles about this car last night just to sort of freshen myself up on it. And they were all from the era, uh, you know, not from today. And frankly, the car was pretty well received at the time by journalists. Quite a few of them thought it was extremely good looking uh, in the context of the cars available at the time. And uh, I'd have to agree. I, I mean, again, I, I look at it today. I don't know how well the design is held up, although I will say, you know, you compare it to like that Daytona that we had, which was a 93, or some of the other 90s cars, which are just so bland. This thing does make an impact, but, um, you know, to compare it to the 63 Riv, which was inarguably and globally beautiful, I'm just not seeing it. I just don't see it as a beautiful car. Uh, I think it's aged okay. I think it still looks pretty fresh, but um, the design of it just doesn't knock me out. Uh, I <laughs> hate saying it. I prefer that. Uh, 79 to 85 model. Uh, but anyway, I tell you what, let me get myself situated and uh, we're going to jump right into the uh, this car itself. All right, so I've pulled the car back here to get out of the sun a little bit, and uh, here we are at the tail end with those rather interesting uh, taillights. The effect is kind of neat. Uh, you see this as a nice chrome supercharged emblem. That's from that uh, 3800 up front, the Series 2 supercharged, which we get into when we get up there, uh, but all very nice and proper. Uh, this is something that I do like, so it still has this, uh, you know, very old school style flip down badge which reveals a trunk key which you can put it in. Uh, I do have some remotes for this but hilariously I forgot to bring them with me. Uh, anyway the trunk is a very nice size. It's actually enormous. You're going to be able to fit lots of crap in here. Uh, the problem is it sort of has a, and forgive my weather strip issue here, <laughs> that kind of looked at. We got stretched out. Uh, but anyway, it has a very big trunk that's sort of hard to get into because it has this high uh, sort of plane of entry. You have to lift your luggage up and you have to organize it properly if it's going to fit inside. And uh, that can be a little bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, underneath this false floor, you've got a yeah, true spare tire. You know, in the old days, you made fun of a temporary spare like that. Today, you don't even get that. It's over. Uh, it's all uh, inflatables and sealant, so it's kind of silly. But... Uh, anyway, you know, befitting a full-sized car that's meant to appeal to nice old people, it does have a properly large trunk uh, to uh, to make it work. Have a look under the hood, and this is probably one of the more interesting parts of this car. Everything's always hard to get under here. Under my keys, I'm telling you. And live my life one-handed these days. So here it is. This is a 3800 Series 2 supercharged V6. Uh, this is widely considered to be, not the specific one, but the 3.8 liter Buick engine uh, is pretty much widely considered to be one of the greatest engines of the 20th century and one of the most revered, one of the most reliable. Uh, it made its debut in 1962. And it was called the Fireball, which frankly is a pretty crappy name for an engine. I mean, I remember reading about a uh, an experimental airplane, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago that some guy was flying, and it was called the Fireball. And I thought, you know... <laughs> It'd be great fun being a test pilot, but I am not necessarily getting in a uh, an airplane named the Fireball, and uh, I think I kind of feel the same way about an engine named that, but um, yeah, it is what it is. Um, before I get into the engine, I will say this rev was unusual in the sense of having fully independent suspension, uh, rear trailing arms, front struts, coil springs. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, pretty advanced for the time. Uh, the frame itself was extremely stiff. Uh, I think it uh, resonated at 25 hertz, which was quite a high number and in line with the 124 Mercedes at the time, uh, which was very, very special. And uh, that was part of uh, Buick's uh, pitch, you know, and the Aurora as well, uh, that it had such a stiff uh, tight frame that it made driving on the highway the smoothness very proper and nice. Uh, they aerodynamicized everything. It had a .33 drag coefficient. The mirrors are aerodynamic. And Buick's mission was to make this a very quiet, very solid boulevard and highway cruiser. And they did pull that off uh, very, very well. 
Uh, but anyway, 62, uh, it progressed. In 67, General Motors actually sold the engine to Kaiser Jeep. Uh, the muscle car era was in full swing. Uh, nobody really wanted a V6. GM didn't think they needed it. They said, the hell with it. They sold it to Jeep. And uh, then a few years later, when the gas crunch hit, they went running back to them. It was now AMC that owned it and bought the thing back as quick as they could to uh, keep up with the, uh, uh, the new realities of the uh, gas and energy crisis. Uh, so that was kind of interesting stuff. Uh, it's also, by the way, this engine was a derivative of that uh, aluminum V6 from Buick, which went on to be sold to the British and uh, became the Rover V8. And between that one and this one, it's like one of the most prolific engines of the 20th century. I think 25 million or so of uh, these particular 3.8s or variations of them have been made. And uh, it just became a cause celebre. Uh, it was supposed to be run out in, uh, this was supposed to be the last one, truly, uh, in 1999, but for, uh, you know, the sake of investors, the sake that it was such a popular engine, uh, they kept building it. They built it uh, all the way through 2008 uh, and put it in a variety of different cars before it got phased out. And there was a big celebration with people uh, at the plant in Flint, Michigan, talking about how great the engine was, a big black tie affair celebrating the end of the 3800, uh, which truly you know, was an end of an era. I mean, that mode, eh, Ward's 10 best list of the 20th century and many, many 10 bests of each year. Just, uh, it is known as being one of the most uh, strong, uh, internally strong and trouble-free and maintenance-free engines ever made. It's all iron block and head, uh, push rod design, two valves per cylinder. It responds very, very well uh, to any kind of tuning. Uh, in fact, uh, it was a variation of this engine that ran in the Grand National, if you remember those cars in the 80s, which were extraordinarily fast for their day, uh, and the uh, GNX, uh, another version of the Grand National that was even faster, and uh, also the uh, Firebird uh, Firehawk, which came out a couple of years later, the Cyclone, the Typhoon, uh, all of them use these uh, sort of highly tuned uh, turbocharged V6 Buicks to great success. And uh, that went on to become this 3800, which graced basically every full-size and mid-size car in the GM lineup for a while. You'd see it in Pontiac, you'd see it in Chevy, and you'd see it in uh, Buick, of course, and Oldsmobile. Uh, you know, some people say that this car should have had a V8, like the Aurora, which had a D2 North Star motor. Uh, the, um, you know, that this should be an eight-cylinder car that uh, competed with the Eldorado. I, I don't necessarily agree. I mean, I think Buick was so famous for the 3800 engine uh, that putting a Series 2 supercharged in it uh, was not really a bad idea. Uh, in 97, it got an upgraded transmission. The um, It had a very good tranny. No, oh, there you go, guys. The 4T60E was a good transmission, but wasn't quite up to the torque of the supercharged motor, which put out, by the way, this was as powerful a motor as Buick had made since the Grand National. Uh, 240 horsepower. Uh, can't immediately remember the torque figure. I think like 280 or something. Uh, but very, very peppy engine. And uh, they did have to upgrade that um, uh, that 4T65E uh, to, uh, to handle the torque of it. The earlier ones with the supercharger and the 60E weren't quite as bulletproof. But uh, by 99, uh, this thing was incredibly well sorted and uh, is a terrific drivetrain in this car. Uh, truly, you know, what makes it one of the great... <sighs> Does it make it one of the great classic Rivieras? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, it's the last rib, so you have to give it credit for that. It's got a great engine, great drivetrain, great frame, great engineering. I mean, Buick didn't screw around with this thing. They were really trying. They really tried hard. Uh, can they be faulted that it didn't work? Yeah, probably. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it didn't work. Uh, anyway, there it is. And, um, you know, maybe it just makes a terrific used car, if not necessarily an aspiring collectible. So, uh, I tell you what, I'm going to shut it off again, and then we're going to get into the interior and go for a spin. I'm going to hang my tag on the back, get everything ready to go. All right, we've got our tag on the back, good to go. 
Um, I will say this is quite a handsome car. It's finished in that what diamond white tricoat metallic, a real Florida color. Uh, inside it's either, I don't know what they call it, mushroom or savanna beige or something, but uh, it's a nice combo and very suited to Florida. Uh, you see I got my bag in the back hanging there. Uh, nice little feature on this is you see the way, it's hard to explain, but with the deck lid up, you can slide your tag in there. It doesn't really bolt. Uh, it just sort of slides in and then it's easy to remove. Now we really have the sun coming. Anyway, the door opens nice and wide, and because this is a full-sized frame, this G, um, <clears throat> is it a G body? Yeah, it doesn't matter anyway, it's big. Uh, same as the Aurora, but a two-seat car. Uh, it gives you a lot of interior room. And frankly, in the plastic fantastic era of 90s GM interiors, I think this one has held up pretty well. Uh, if not in terms of its uh, physical condition, certainly in terms of its design. Uh, you've got what kind of look like two buckets in the back, but really is three passenger seating, although I don't know who you'd put in the middle. Uh, but certainly your Canadians in the back seat are going to be pretty relatively chipper for having uh, to be in the back of a, you know, a two-seat car, or sorry, a four-seat two-door car. Uh, they've got pretty good leg room. They've got pockets for gun storage. Uh, they've got a nice little center console that pops out, and because it's a fancy car, it probably, let's see if it has any kind of cup holders. It doesn't. That's a shame, but you do have ashtrays, so if there's smokers, they'll have that going for them, and uh, everything uh, nice and proper in the back seat. Uh, Buick did put a lot of engineering into the front seats. Apparently, they tested them extensively with uh, a huge market segment of people where they actually sent out pressure pads to people uh, that they would sit on, and Buick would <laughs> record their ass cheek indentations on a computer uh, pressure mat that then got made into digital information so that they could design the front seats in a way that wouldn't put pressure points on you, uh, which is part of what makes long drives fatiguing. So uh, definitely a lot of engineering went into that. Uh, they did use these Mercedes style and Lincoln style uh, seat switch controls. It's got lumbar there. Uh, you know, these do make it very easy to adjust, but I do think they belong on the door panel and not necessarily on the side of the seat because honestly, you can't really see them when they're on the side of the seat, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, I do like the way the dash swoops into the door panels, and I think that actually looks quite modern. I think if uh, you replace this sort of 90s Delco Bose looking thing with a big, you know, modern flat screen, it, that thing could actually pass for a modern car, and, uh, you know, that's a testament. I mean, uh, GM interiors in the 90s were, yeah, they were pretty crap, and uh, in many ways this was the best of them. Uh, the door panel is nice and tight, lots of circles in this car, uh, we'll get into that in a second, uh, but you've got your windows, you've got your mirrors, your memory seats, and your heated seats, your fuel and trunk release, uh, nice big long map pocket there, which would be a good place to store weapons of any variety. Uh, you got tons of room down there, and uh, there it is, so let's just hop in. I also do like the frameless glass, I have to say, although I think it would have been better if they had continued that into a hardtop coupe setup uh, instead of having fixed rear windows. Fire it up. Yeah, you know, you never really do get much sound from a Buick V6 that means anything, but um, it's a great motor, but it really doesn't sound like anything. Okay, so here is a pretty unusual instrument cluster for the day. Uh, one thing that I don't like about it is it's off-center. When you're sitting straight like this, the tack is kind of buried off and half hidden by the steering wheel. Uh, one could also argue, why the hell does a Buick Riviera need a tack? I mean, it's got an automatic transmission that's, you know, shifting and revving is regulated. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's got a rev limiter. <laughs> you know, the guy who drives this thing is not really going to care too much about a tack. But anyway, there it is and does belie the history of the Riviera sportiness. Uh, I also appreciate that they are true analog dials instead of, um, you know, all the sort of digital wizardry that uh, Buick had in the 80s and 90s that looked great for about one year and then all fizzled out into nothing and broke. Uh, security is a big deal in this car. You see, it still has a security light on. I don't know why, but if you remember, the 90s was full of uh, crime bills and everybody worried about super predators. So, uh, so that was uh, something that uh, car companies were sensitive to when they made sure you knew you had good 
security. Uh, you've got a pretty interesting analog slash programmable headlight switch, which is, um, uh, you know, you have automatic headlights, which you can adjust the length of delay and whatnot, but it does also work analog and it does twist uh, to give you the um, uh, dimming feature, which is a very nice design. I have to say that is a very nice headlight switch and I like it. Uh, it is, of course, a tilt steering column. Uh, the entirety of the airbag is a horn pad. So no matter where you go on it, you're going to get your horn. Uh, you have radio and uh, temperature controls on here. It's a multifunct. Well, it's very very sensitive uh, but anyway all very nice uh, if this didn't have traction control it would have the world's largest uh, trip reset button uh, it does so you can turn off your traction control with that uh, let's get a little bit of air conditioning going actually I had the defrost on earlier but now we need a little bit of AC very, very nice. Nice cold air in this car. Uh, Buick added this little wood surround over the uh, temp uh, control and the uh, radio because they had received a lot of complaints that the interior was just too spartan. I'm not sure that adding this one little bit of wood on the car really did anything, but... They seem to think so. But anyway, let's count the circle. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We've got 16 circles in the dashboard. Take that uh, Mercedes CLK from the uh, <laughs> early 2000s. That's a lot of circles. And uh, of course, that was uh, by design. Uh, again, I do like the swooping overhang on the dash, the way it goes into the door panels. I think that's pretty. Uh, you've got these two out of place vents here, which aren't circles. Uh, you've got, uh, when you pop this out, the ashtray pops out. Uh, I guess Buick thought its people still smoked, so they gave you a nice big prolific ashtray there. Uh, let me get that down. Uh, you got in-dash uh, CD storage, all very lovely. And then this big, cheap looking, well, let me get that back in, thing swoops forward and reveals a couple of cup holders. So all very nice stuff. Uh, and there is a little bit more wood there on your uh, center column shifter. Uh, apparently you could get these things, at least in 95, with the front bench seat, 60-40 seat. Nobody did, but apparently you could. And uh, then it would have had a column shifter. Uh, you also have a center console area where it gives you a coin purse and a nice little spot to store in nine millimeter of some variety. Uh, we do have books with this car, but I left it at the shop, but there's a nice big uh, the glove box. You get that because they put the um, airbag up on top of the dash and that will turn off the trunk release. You also have a self-dimming mirror with a compass, nice stuff, home link garage door openers, and uh, man, did they take their sun visors seriously in this car. So you've got your uh, cocaine mirror there, you've got powder on your nose, you can fly this over to the side to get sun there, then roll this down to get sun there, extend this if you got more sun. So, uh, man, I tell you what, they got you covered in the sun visor department when it comes to 99 Rivieras. Put it in drive and away we go. The car was also pretty quick for its day. Uh, again, 240 horse, 280 foot pounds. Uh, it would do zero to 60 in under seven seconds, which is pretty friggin' fast for a Buick. <laughs> That was being marketed to old guys. Uh, quarter mile was in the, well, I want to say in the 15s, like 15.5 or something. And uh, the top speed was governed, uh, uh, what was it governed to? Under 110, I believe. Um, why? I don't know, but they did. Uh, I doubt anyone ever really, um, you know, any one of their traditional customers got up that high. Now there was a new guy in the back who detailed this one. I don't. His name's Daniel. He seems like a nice guy. He's been trained by Dalton, which is a serious red flag right off the bat. Uh, but let's see how he did on the windshield. Yeah, 180 times better than Dalton on the guy's like second day. Uh, as someone famously pointed out in one of the other videos, it's like Dalton cleans the front windshield with a raw chicken thigh. Um, you know, this guy, yeah, you know, it ain't bad. It's certainly a lot better than anything I've seen from Dalton, that little bastard who, uh, you know, threatens to leave and never does. So anyway, I'm still going to pause it and we'll pick it up at the end of the road. All right, let's see if there's anything on the radio. There usually never is. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know. I can do without Bruce Springsteen half the time. I know he's very talented. Okay, so you do get instant torque from that. Uh, there we are, well past 60, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty quick car. Uh, Buick used the supercharger, they said, because they uh, wanted the instant smooth torque instead of a turbo. Uh, I got those signs telling me to slow down. I believe it. Um, and that does fit with the character of the car. I mean, more than anything else, their design theme with this thing was to be smooth. And they do seem to have pulled that off pretty damn well. Uh, the stiffness of the frame it really does tie nicely into the, uh, the, you know, the suspension is tuned, not nearly as stiff as the Aurora. Uh, it still gives you kind of a boulevard ride, but it is fully independent. You got four wheel disc brakes, you got ABS. Uh, you know, the body feels nice and tight. I mean, here's this thing with 74,000 miles. Uh, it's not a concours car. It's not perfect, but it's, you know, a pretty damn good survivor uh, that's been well maintained by a nice older couple. And it has held up very well. Uh, it's got sort of a uh, variable adjust magneta hydro steering like that caterpillar drive from the hunt for red october it is something like that uh, but the steering does feel nice it's on center it stiffens as you go faster <clears throat> and um it does uh it does feel pretty good uh brakes i don't want to nail it with this guy there they'll think i'm weird but let's do kind of a we're kind of alone in the road so yeah yeah, you know, exceptional brakes. They really grip nice. Um, the car is lovely to drive, and it feels big, and it doesn't feel loosey-goosey, front-drivey, GM crappy the way that a lot of those 90s cars do. Uh, it has held up quite well. And, uh, you know, on my highway ride this morning, it, all felt, it also felt very nice. So, I mean, it just is a terrific cruiser. Um, on the collector car market, you could argue that it should um, certainly start picking up as at least an entry-level collectible. Uh, and I suppose it has. I mean, I've gone to a few of these auctions over the past couple of years, and I've seen a few of these cars running around, so uh, they're not unthought of. Um, there, I've got air going up to the windshield. Um, so they're not unthought of, but they're not, um, they're not in any way becoming, uh, you know, uber collectible or anything. For the moment, they're just basically, uh, frankly, a pretty good used car bargain. I mean, you've got one of the great engines of the 20th century, a bulletproof transmission, uh, Buick's and GM's huge R&D budget that they put into this car that didn't pay off. Uh, it drives like a dream. It's lovely to ride around and maintenance costs are low, repairs are low, and uh, frankly, it just makes a really, really nice uh, daily commuter and a really nice daily driver. So uh, the idea that maybe it'll start creeping up in collector value yeah, who knows? Hope so, uh, for Buick's sake, but um, we'll see. Anyway, there it is. So the last Buick Riviera. Um, not my favorite Riviera, but I have to tell you, it's a Riv. I love Rivs, and I'm going to love this one uh, just because it, um, well, because it's a Riviera, and it ain't bad. So uh, it will be for sale at Auto House of Naples if you have an interest, 239-263-8500, on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, I know I've been lax with the videos. I swear I'm going to try to get more coming. We're going to get more than one a week. I'm going to try like hell to get something for tomorrow or the next day, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep rolling along, and uh, hopefully the weather will, you know, not get too miserable in the meantime. So thank you for having a look. Really, really appreciate it, and uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.